The world's most famous scientist, physicist, Professor Stephen Hawking, who has just retired from Isaac Newton's chair at Cambridge University, has written a new book called The Grand Design, which is bound to be a world bestseller. I hold in my hand a Times supplement describing this book. And in it, Stephen Hawking is concerned to discuss what he thinks is going to be a unified theory of everything that unites the fundamental laws of physics. But what has ignited a discussion all around the world is not so much the physics, but the conclusions that Hawking draws from the physics. For instance, he says this, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. The discussion has been ignited by those words because Stephen Hawking, who up until now appears to have been teasing people about whether or not his theories leave room for God, he seems now to have moved decisively to the other side and embrace atheism. At least that appears to be what Richard Dawkins and the new atheists think. Now, I'm a mathematician and also interested in the philosophy of science. And what I'd like to look at for a little while are the implications and the methods which Hawking uses to deduce that there is no God. It seems to me that Stephen Hawking is guilty of a number of factual misunderstandings and logical fallacies. But the first and most important thing to say, I think, is this, that his understanding of God is defective. Because in suggesting that all space for God is removed by asserting that God isn't necessary to light the blue touch paper, Hawking is very clearly thinking in terms of a God of the gaps. That is, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. A God of the gaps that, according to Richard Dawkins, has been banished from biology by Darwin, and now Stephen Hawking is administering the last coup de grace by abolishing that same God from physics. But God is not a God of the gaps. That is the God that is presented to us in the Bible, the God in whom adherents of the three great monotheistic religions believe in. He is the God of the whole show. He not only started the universe, but he sustains it. Indeed, if he hadn't created and didn't sustain the universe, there wouldn't be anything for scientists like Stephen Hawking to study. So, this notion of God being God of the gaps is very defective and it affects the rest of Hawking's argument. Now, it seems to me also that Hawking's defective understanding of God is connected with a defective understanding of philosophy. He writes, philosophy is dead. It has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. As a result, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. I find this an astonishing statement. First of all, leaving aside the scientific hubris of it, it constitutes wonderful evidence that at least one scientist, Hawking himself, has not only not kept up with philosophy, he does not appear to understand the first thing about it, nor its commitment to the elementary rules of logical analysis. Because, of course, his statement, philosophy is dead, science has not kept up with it, is itself a statement of philosophy. Hawking is not avoiding the metaphysics that he despises. It's a classic example, therefore, of logical incoherence. Not only that, but Hawking's book, insofar as it is an interpretation and application of science to ultimate questions like the existence of God 
is of the very essence of metaphysics. Stephen Hawking's inadequate grasp of philosophy and apparent despising of it leads him into trouble right at the very beginning. Take his statement that I quoted at the outset. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Well, if I say that X created Y, that statement presupposes the existence of X in order to bring Y into existence. So that if I say X created X, I'm presupposing the existence of X in order to bring X into existence, but it already is in existence. That statement is self-contradictory. It is logically incoherent. But perhaps worse than that, Hawking says, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So setting aside the logical problem, he's saying that gravity already exists, but that's not nothing. And indeed, one might add that when physicists talk about nothing, they usually mean something very different from nothing. They usually mean a quantum vacuum. It seems to me that here we are having much ado about nothing. Stephen Hawking here is using the same absurd argument as the Oxford chemist Peter Atkins uses in his book, what he calls the cosmic bootstrap principle. I quote, space-time generates its own dust in the process of its own self-assembly. And of course he's referring there to the self-contradictory idea of a person lifting himself by pulling on his own bootlaces. His Oxford colleague, philosopher of religion Keith Ward, is surely right to say that Atkins' view of the universe is as blatantly self-contradictory as the name he gives to it. After all, it's logically impossible for a cause to bring about some effect without already being in existence. And Keith Ward concludes, between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of a cosmic bootstrap, there's no competition. We were always right to think that persons or universes who seek to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps are forever doomed to failure. What this all shows is, of course, that nonsense remains nonsense even when talked by world-famous scientists. Well, let's now take this argument further. We've seen that Hawking's concept of God is inadequate and so is his concept of philosophy. That leads him into further blunders. And perhaps the most serious of them is to offer us, apparently, the choice between God and the laws of physics. Now this confuses two very different things. First of all, physical law, and secondly, God who is a personal agent. And so the choice we're asked to make is a choice between incommensurate alternatives. That is, Hawking is making a classic category error if that is the choice he's offering us. Let me put it this way. To ask us to choose between either the laws of physics or God is like asking to choose between the laws of physics or Sir Frank Whittle in order to explain the existence of the jet engine. That mistake was not made by a previous holder of Hawking's chair, Sir Isaac Newton himself. When he discovered the laws of gravitation, he didn't say, now I have gravity, I have the law, I don't need God. No, what he did was to write the most famous book of the history of science, the Principia Mathematica, expressing the hope that it would persuade the thinking man to believe in God. In order to explain a jet engine, we need both Frank Whittle and the laws of physics. These are not contradictory explanations, but complementary. The one is in terms of an agent who designed it, and the other is in terms of the physical principles on which it operates. In a sense, they are answering different questions. How does it work? And how did it come to exist in the first place? But there's something more. Because 
the laws of physics and Frank Whittle taken together will not produce a jet engine. You need another ingredient. That is the matter, the material, out of which the jet engine is to be made. So now we have three things that we need. We need material, we need laws of physics, and we need an agent. Stephen Hawking is confining himself to the laws of physics only. And that brings us to the next error in his thinking as I understand it. Because the laws of physics cannot create anything. Think now of the whole universe. Science certainly didn't put it there. Scientists didn't put it there. And the laws of physics didn't put it there. Because physical laws on their own cannot create anything. The idea of a theory or physical laws bringing the universe into existence strikes me as completely off the wall. Scientists expect to develop theories involving natural laws that describe natural phenomena and they've done so and Hawking has done so with spectacular success. However, the laws that we find cannot themselves even cause anything, let alone create it. For instance, Newton's law of gravitation does not create gravity. It doesn't even explain gravity as Newton himself realized. Mathematical laws often amount to this. They say if you've got A, then you get B. If you give a billiard ball a force of such and such at an angle of such and such, then it will bounce off the cushion with a speed of such and such. But the laws don't produce the billiard ball, nor do they produce the force that's needed to get it in motion. They're simply descriptions, predictions, that enable you to analyse what will happen if you've got A. So to think that they've got creative powers is to make an utterly fundamental mistake. The world of strict naturalism in which clever mathematical laws all on their own bring the universe and life into existence is to my mind pure science fiction. The fact is that theories and laws do not bring mass energy into existence. And the view that they nevertheless somehow have had that capacity seems a rather desperate refuge and it's very hard to see how it could be anything else from the alternative possibility that there is a God who brought everything into existence and sustains it in being.